year goes by pretty quickly and uh, you keep looking better and better so that's good <laughs> i gotta tell my wife that why don't we why don't we start with the uh, with the slide slide presentation i would say cloning 101 and just some things i've learned over the years and some things that have actually surprised me so you know pabrai funds is a cloned fund it's a, it's a replica of the buffett investment partnerships and when i started it in 1999 it was 30 years after buffett ended his partnership and uh, you can probably say even from then till now it's probably one of the most successful hedge fund operations ever in the history of humanity and it was very surprising to me that when i found in 99 when i looked at i couldn't find any examples of uh, any funds that had replicated the unusual structure of the Buffett partnerships. Things like no management fees, only performance fees, or reporting once a year, not disclosing holdings, and so on and so forth, and really focusing on investing, if you will. And I cloned, I cloned as many of those attributes of the Buffett partnerships when I started for Bry Funds. And I realized only a few years later that each one of those unusual attributes gave, gave Pabrai funds quite a bit of competitive advantage. And even now, it's been about more than 15 years since I started. It still tends to be true. It's not zero, but the number of funds or the percentage of funds that are willing to manage capital in this format is a rounding error. It's less than one-tenth or one-hundredth or one-percent. It's a very low number. I, I could count on one hand or maybe two hands at the most, the number of funds I know who follow that structure. So it's reinforced by belief that cloning is very powerful and such. And then let's go to the next slide. And then if you look at the foundation, which is the family foundation I set up about with my wife about eight years ago. And Dakshina is also a cloned model. And basically, so we cloned a guy in terms of, he had a model called Super 30 for sending kids to IIT, and we went and cloned that. But beyond that, what I did is, almost everything about the way Dakshina is run is taken from Buffett and Munger principles. And if I thought that no one in the hedge fund universe was smart enough to follow the Buffett partnerships, I think the nonprofit world is so much more, I would say, unwilling to clone. So uh, Dakshina follows some very core principles of Buffett and Munger, and I'll just highlight some of those because that is the way nonprofits should be run, but it is not the way they are run. And again, the end result is that we look so good because we are compared to all these yo-yos, and it just makes it look that much better. So one of these Buffett principles on nonprofits is that nonprofits ought to narrow their focus on one or two well-defined causes because you're taking on, unlike making money when you're trying to kind of improve the world, it's a much more difficult challenge. So to have any chance of success at all, you want to concentrate all your resources into at the most one or two focused directions and most nonprofits are unwilling to do that. They're kind of a jack of all trades. Then the second is that when you have endowments within nonprofits where they've got a pot of money like the Ford Foundation or Rockefeller Foundation and so on, then when those assets get invested, Munger's belief is that, and he's written about that for Charlie's Almanac, Munger's belief is that those assets in a nonprofit found endowment should be extremely concentrated. And when he means by extremely concentrated, he said that 90 plus percent of it were in one stock, that's perfectly fine. And and there are, I, I'm actually not aware of any nonprofits other than maybe a few that were set up with founder stock and there was some kind of mandate from the founder that they couldn't sell it. But even then, I'm not aware of any that have remained, remained focused and concentrated in one or two securities. And Munger's reason for saying that, he says that first of all, Anyway, when you embark on trying to change the world, it is a very high risk activity with a high failure rate because the odds that you're going to be able to do that are low. So you want to basically, in effect, unlike investing, you want to, in the case of a nonprofit, swing for the fences. And you want to swing for the fences in a very major way. And part of the swinging for the fences is one is you pick a cause, hopefully a tough cause, and the second way you swing for the fences is you put everything into your absolutely best investment, best investment idea so that you can maximize returns 
and so you can basically hit the ball as as far out of the park as possible and the counter to that is that if it doesn't work out let's say for example you put it all in one stock and that stock goes to zero the thing is let's say for example you're trying to find a cure for ebola or some virus like that that's swinging for the fences and that you may put tens of millions into that and it may go to zero as well so buffett buffett and mungo's perspective is that you want to truly on all fronts with a non-profit truly swing for the fences so pick one cause and put everything in one stock and that's what dakshina has done is we've we've identified and we obviously we cloned someone else's model so that gave us a plenty of cover but the rest of it i've always been willing to to swing for the fences and one thing about dakshina is that because we decided we would give up like my wife and i said we'd give up 2% of our net worth every year if you put everything in one stock and that stock went to zero all that would mean is that year we couldn't do anything more and uh, next year again we'd have 2% of assets and then kind of get going again just the way set up we we think we don't have a such situation where it would terminate no matter what decisions we took so again what i found is that there were a, today there are a few cloners on the pabrai fund buffett model if you will i have run into almost no cloners in fact i know of no, no non profits that are embracing those buffett and munger principles in that way and truly swinging for the fences and and they ought to but they aren't and then if we come to my latest venture thando which is a holding company i set up about a year ago we raised about 150 million from a number of investors in the first quarter of this year and we've agreed to acquire an insurance company a privately held insurance company and we hope to finish the acquisition before the end of the year and uh, so dando is a is designed to be and eventually we'll make it public so that the the investors can if they want to cash out they can sell stock and we end up with a permanent capital vehicle because these companies that we intend to acquire we don't intend to ever sell them so it's not like private equity it would be kind of buy and hold forever like berkshire or fairfax and such and so dando again is a cloned idea i looked at berkshire hathaway and i looked at Fair, looked at fairfax financial and looked at markel and so on and uh, i was intrigued by the idea of being able to make investments in asset classes other than stocks because all pabrai funds can do is invest in stocks and the idea of owning entire businesses and then replicating that aspect of the buffett model which is you buy businesses and you leave them alone delegation to the point of abdication i found that was again not being applied not being cloned very much and i thought that model had some legs and so i thought i'd, I'd give it a try and it's dawned on me relatively recently it didn't even dawn on me when i set up thando it really dawned on me i would say probably 3 or 4 months ago so there are about 3000 casualty companies in the united states collectively they take in about 550 billion a year in premiums so it's a sizable industry but the out of the 3000 companies the number of companies that follow the berkshire hathaway model of running an insurance company and running float and investing in equities and all of that that whole model of running an insurance company it was really surprising for me to find is replicated at all i would say once you get past the Berkshires and Hills and Fairfaxes of the world. I've looked at insurance company after insurance company, and what I find is that the if they are really good at insurance, which many of them are, and many of them aren't, but the ones who are really good at insurance, they tend to have absolutely no understanding of the investment side. And uh, and in looking back, I guess it makes sense because the two disciplines are so different from each other that typically the skills you need to be a great underwriter or a great operator on the insurance side are not really that useful on the investment side. And so typically, the companies that have the great operators on the insurance side have no clue what to do on the investment side, and they tend to go institutional or they tend to sit in treasuries or they just kind of sit in fixed income. And what you really have to do. which is so hard for these companies to do is you have to take a non institutional approach to asset management or investment management and that non institutional approach means that you need to identify and find a lou simpson the way geico did and then give the entire investment portfolio to lou simpson and then tell him carte blanche to whatever you want 
and no one's going to look over your shoulders. And so the there are two or three skills needed to do that. One is the biggest stumbling block would be an ability to identify a person like Lou Simpson, which would be very hard to do. I think Warren Buffett is extremely good at that. So most of these companies have no ability to identify Lou Simpson if he was standing in front of them. And the second is that after you identify Lou Simpson, you've got to take a non-institutional approach and give that person full freedom. And again, that's really hard to do in a kind of very regulated and cut and dry industry like insurance, where you leave me hands off, if you will. And, and so when I formed Hando, I was thinking that we would buy private assets or make in, in the assets investments in, in stocks. We might even invest in real estate, etc. My thinking has actually evolved to be much more focused on the insurance industry. And the reason is because there's such a large amount of assets and companies that have such a uh, such a poor approach to investing that can truly add value when when Thando acquires them. Because I would leave them alone on the insurance side and I take over managing the investments. And uh, and so I just wanted to illustrate that basically you've got these three quite different operations all cloned in different ways and all cloned from Buffett and Munger and I would find I would say that the number of people who are willing to do value investing itself is a small number very small number but it is a really huge number compared to the number of insurance companies that have embarked on the Berkshire model or the number of nonprofits that have taken a cue for Buffett and Munger and so what I found is that as I've gone, if you will, deeper into the cloning on Buffett and Munger, I found that the field is completely open. It's, I still find even on the investing side is completely open, but you still at least have a sliver of intelligent life. And I would say in these other areas, there's hardly, I would say in the nonprofit world, close to zero intelligent life. And on even on the Thando side, we haven't really run into real competitors on that front in terms of people who are truly willing to leave managements alone to run the investment insurance business and then run the investments and so on. Just wanted to share that and then want to switch gears a little bit and a little bit about farmland in Iowa. And I think Arvin's wife is from, from these parts in rural Illinois or was she from Iowa? Rural Illinois. Rural Illinois, close enough. This is close to what within 10 miles of her house looks like. So anyway, if you look at the average price per acre of Iowa farmland, and uh, this is not inflation adjusted or anything from 1950 to 2013, and you see a big jump. That's actually not in one year. It was about 5,000 an acre in 2010, and it's about 8,700 an acre in 2013. And you can see long periods of hardly any movement between, uh, let's say, 1980 and 2000. You have approximately a 10% drop in land prices. And even from 1950 to 1970, you don't see much of a rise. These are, these are the prices per year of, of the value per acre. And again, you can see that 2010 is 5,000 an acre and 2013 is 8700 you can see how it's evolved from 1980 and if you look at these are rents so if you owned a farm and you wanted to rent it out so i just wanted to focus on the left hand side which is the cropland uh, cropland rent per acre and you can see like in 2014 it's 260 an acre and in 2013 it's 255 an acre and so on and then you can see there's one column, which is three, two columns over, which is rent as a percentage of value. And you can see that in 2014, it's uh, about 3%. And in 2010, it's 4%. So it's moved between 3% and at the most 6.5% of the value of the, of the land. And uh, the reason I'm, I'm showing you all this is that if someone were to buy or rent, Iowa farmland. They're only doing it mainly for one reason, and that is that they intend to farm that land and they intend to grow either corn or soybeans and sell that corn or soybean. And the corn or soybean market is a commodity market. And so the buyers know what 
present prices of corn and soybean are. They know what the historical prices are. They know what the inputs are in terms of land, fertilizer, labor, capital, machinery, and so on. And you've also got variables that you don't control. You don't control weather, which can go all over the place. You also don't control supply and demand. And the selling price of, of the crops can change. You also don't fully control the price of fertilizer. And even that can, that can move around. So when these transactions take place, when people buy Iowa farmland or when they rent Iowa farmland, these are negotiated transactions between an intelligent buyer and an intelligent seller. And because you have a negotiated transaction between an intelligent buyer and an intelligent seller, and your underlying asset is a productive asset. So these are not Rembrandt, these are not Ferrari. These are productive assets being traded between an intelligent buyer and an intelligent seller. The, the buyer has to do an analysis over the next, some viewpoint over the next 10, 20, 30 years, what crop prices are going to be like and what kind of profits he, can, he or she can make from the land. And then based on all of that, they'll make an offer. And then if the buyers and sellers agree, then you have a deal and then you end up with these prices. So this is quite different from the way stock markets work. And, and so if I look at these the rents that are being charged, you don't see much movement from year to year. You can see 2007, it's 150 an acre, then it goes to 170, which is like about, about 12% or 13%. Then it hardly moves about 3% to 175 and, and so on. And so those movements, are, and even though I'm not showing monthly prices or daily prices, if you were to chart even the monthly or daily, price, you would not see much gyrations. It'd be a fairly smooth curve in terms of how these prices move. And when we get to stock markets, then stock markets don't operate this way because those are, those are auction driven markets. I gave Arvind the spreadsheet, which has about 13 or thousand ticker symbols, one ticker symbol per row of the spreadsheet. And then he's going to go to a website called random.org. So what we're, uh, what we're doing here is we're, we're picking a random stock. So I'm not, I don't even know what stock it's going to be, no idea. And uh, we're just going to look at uh, kind of what the price movement on that stock's been. And this could be a stock in any part of the world. So this stock is in the U.S. It's oh, ticker, yeah, ticker PKE. P is in Paul, K is in King, E is in Elephant, and it's the company name is Park Electrochemical Corp. Okay, I've never heard of this company. Maybe Arvind has. Maybe he owns ah. it in his portfolio. <laughs> um, all right. So basically, if we look at, let's say, just I'm just looking at. I pulled up Google Finance, so you can pull up whatever website you want which you prefer arvind which has we'll use stock. the same as you okay i'm just looking on google finance and you can see that the 52 week range on this stock is like from 19 dollars to 32 dollars okay and maybe if one of you has a calculator if you take right. the bottom to the top how much more than the top is the more is the top from the bottom is it is like 50 55 percent 68 percent Okay, so you know, from basically, if you bought at the bottom, some of you knew that at the bottom, with this random company and you sold at the top, within 12 months, you'd have 68%. Then if I look at five years, I'm looking at the five-year chart on this thing, and okay. the lowest price needs, seems to be around $20. It probably is at $19 price, and the highest price needs, seems to be about 34 So we have about 70% or so movement. And right. if you see that chart, I'm going to see the chart for all years from the beginning. Yeah. So if you, if you see the chart from, this is going from 1978 onwards, you can see really from kind of 93 or 94 onwards, it's fairly choppy. It just goes up and down all over the place. And, and then you can see actually in probably in during that dot com boom, this thing went from 15 bucks to 50 bucks in a few months. And such. So anyway, let's pull up another symbol, Arvind. Let's run the generator again. Sounds great. Mirror on the wall. <laughs> that 
translates into a company called Premier Gold Mines Limited in Toronto, ticker PG dot TO. Okay, so here we see a one year range between a dollar twenty eight and three dollars and fifty two cents. And what is how high is that? What is the percentage that the high is high above the low? So it's like two twenty six. It's almost two hundred percent over the thing. And if you look at so again, you got massive swing within a year. And then if you look at a five year range on this thing, it's all the way from eight dollars wow. to a dollar forty five. So again, this is not anything like Iowa farmland and you're seeing all these wide swings and the, one of the big reasons you see these swings, of course, they are probably gold miner and they're probably tied to the gold price and whatever people think is happening. But again, another part of this whole thing is that it's not negotiated transaction. It's auction driven markets. So let's pick another one. Arvind. That translates into a company in Singapore called Communication Design International Limited, SHTSI. Oh, excuse me, I think that's a five, so 5HT. Five okay, this is also a nano cap or something, but let's see what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think a one year, what's a one year range on this? Right, it's, market cap uh, of 34 million. Yeah, so it's now here you've got from 3 cents to 15 cents. So, you know, a 5x delta in a year. And if you look at, look at five years, it's like gone up to, it looks like it's close to an all time high here. So it's like <laughs> 14 cents to like two, 2 cents to 14 cents. And if well, I look at the whole. According to Google, it's, uh, it's at eight times PE. It might be a great buy. <laughs> maybe you can buy it for your fund maybe, maybe. and and then if you, even if you look at the all-time range from 2006 you can see from two cents to 45 cents or something and such anyway i think we could do this for a long time but the bottom line is that these picks these picks aren't value picks they're random pick and what tends to happen when you're doing value investing is you'll tend to buy things when they are in general cheap and you might even be getting them closer to the bottom of the 52 week range because if you've been looking over if you've been looking at for a while it may be that finally gets to the point that it's cheap and one of the one of the advantages you get with value investing is that just because of this natural wider swing in this asset class you can so if you were an investor and you were limited to only buying iowa farmland and that was the only asset class you could buy and sell or do options or whatever else you basically would be screwed because you saw what that chart looked like and uh, you can do fine if you're a farmer and such though people who are buying today that iowa farmland may not do so well it might be good to rent today because you're getting it pretty cheap if you rent it so basically these these stock market based assets that you're buying are really completely and uniquely different from any other asset. They're very different from buying whole businesses. They're very different from buying cars. They're very different from buying real estate. They're very different from pretty much any other asset class you can do. And it's because you're not dealing with face to face, but face to face, when you do intelligent buyer facing intelligent seller, you will tend to get more more times than not pretty rational pricing. Sometimes you can get distortion, like in 2000, late 2008, early 2009, even private assets would get undervalued because people are just freaked out or need cash or something. But in most circumstances, you won't get that with negotiated transactions. But you can always, almost always find that in equity markets because of these swings that are going on, companies are going through all sorts of things like today the today i think i didn't check but how much was the dow down today are with 300 over 300 okay yeah so the over 300 points and so all kinds of businesses got marked down and i used to give the example in fact i'll take a look here there's a company called service corp 
Let me... And you can see that Service Corp, if uh, Arvind pulls it up, it's got, uh, it dropped 2% in price today. And uh, this is a company that buries dead people. And they're in the funeral services business. Whatever caused the market to go down, Arvind, what caused the market to go down? I have no idea. Anyone else want to take a crack of what happened? What happened that caused the market to go down today? You know how these commentators have a one sentence answer. Like I heard earlier today on CNBC that, and maybe I don't know if this was the reason why I just caught a sound bite where they were concerned about Draghi, Mario Draghi. And they said that people are concerned that the emperor has no clothes. Maybe they're questioning <laughs> his ability to actually do things in Europe. So I don't know what, what happened, but something jolted the market. I have no idea what happened, but whatever jolted the market, it did not increase human life expectancy. <laughs> did it increase human life expectancy today? Doubtful. Any of you can answer. Did we have any change in the way humans take care of their dead today? Maybe, maybe few people have died, I don't know. But fewer people died? Yeah. You think fewer people died? Arvind, do, do we have Ebola on the screen or not on the TV nowadays? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so basically you look at something like Service Corp. So whenever they, you have these big up and downs in the Dow, if Service Corp were a private business and they were negotiating to sell the business and they have been negotiating and yesterday they had agreed to some price, and then today the buyer comes and says, listen, the Dow dropped 300 points, so I need to drop your pop, your price by 2%. The seller would tell them, go take a hike. They're not concerned with all that. And so you can see that you have these swings taking place. And today is a good example where everything gets marked down. And Service Corp is just an example, an extreme example of a company which is just burying dead people or cremating dead people. And what a wonderful business to be in. And uh, why should they have any impact whatsoever on their, on their business valuation because of today, but it did. And in fact, even if you look at service call, I'll just pull up the, like the one year, one year range on this thing. So sure, sure. if you look at the one year range of this, it's like from 17 to $23. Again, that's a fairly large range for a company that is doing something as benign as burying dead people. And if you look at it 10 years, over 10 years, this thing has gone from, I don't know, like $2, $2 or $3 all the way up to 20, 23. And their business, in fact, the funny thing is it went down a lot during the financial crisis. You see that chart during the financial crisis in 2008 yeah. and 2009? Okay. Yeah. Did people stop dying then? <laughs> yeah. Did they have more heart attacks at that time? Or less heart attacks. Did the like the human mortality change at that time? What happened there? Nothing happened. And neither did they have margins or anything else. So you can see what's happening. And this would not be the chart if we had a chart of private transactions of buying and selling of funeral homes. This would not be the chart that would show up. That'd be a completely different chart. So those those are my kind of remarks I wanted to make. And we can talk about anything you have in mind now, Arvind. Yeah, I think that's a good question. You know, I think that I had exit interviewed everyone who was at that lunch after the lunch. We didn't have any recording devices and none of us took any notes while we were at the lunch. And I wanted to capture as much of it as I could. And I made some notes after talking to everyone. We, we actually covered about 54 different topics, a wide range of topics over three hours. And with Warren, there isn't, there isn't much that's not in the public domain. And I don't think he he told us much that we couldn't have found somewhere else. But what the lunch did for me, it helped me calibrate and understand better what is really important to him and this kind of way he thinks about it. And a few things that kind of stood out is, is one is this discussion that we had with him about the inner scorecard versus out of scorecard. And he, even he mentioned at the lunch that it, it wasn't out then, but it was about to be released in Alice Schroeder's biography. So if you read her biography, you can find a, a bit of a write-up on that front. And he said, would you like to be the 
greatest lover in the world but known as the worst or the worst lover in the world and known as the greatest and he said if you know how to answer that question you've got it made so what what became clear is that Warren clearly marches to his own drummer and to a very large extent he does not care what the world thinks and so he is he is very willing to to take a stand which is unconventional which is even unpopular and he doesn't really care what the impacts are. and then just one example would be you know the way you know he's a guy in the midwest but he has a wife and a mistress for decades and and he's in the public eye and it's an irrelevant data point for him as to what people would think of it or make of it so that is a person who's in a scorecard and i think in in, in investing that is very important because you want to have independence of thought so typically when you're making investments they will tend to be as a value investor they tend to be cheap usually they tend to be cheap for a particular reason and that reason is probably believed by lots of people and so you're in effect taking a contrarian view and so you need to have conviction in those contrarian <laughs> views so that was that was one thing the second is that when we when we talked to him about i asked him i asked him a question about Rick Gurren because at that time I hadn't heard about Rick Gurren in several decades after the 70s and I knew that he Buffett and Warren and Rick were close and there was only the two of them who were partners so I just asked Warren hey what happened to Rick Gurren and he converted almost any question into a learning opportunity and so he the way he answered the question was that he explained how Rick was levered going into the big downturn in stock prices in 73 74 and because he was levered he got margin calls and such and he got squeezed and he actually was forced to sell his blue chip stamp and berkshire shares to like sequoia front and buffett at the prices at that time which were nothing i think he sold berkshire stock at 40 dollars a share to to warren or something like that and, uh, and then warren went one step further he said that you charlie and i always knew that we were going to get very rich, but we weren't in a hurry. And Rick was in a hurry. And then he went even one step further than that. He said that if you are even a slightly above an average investor and you spend less than you earn, you cannot help but get wealthy over a lifetime. And you can clearly see that this is front and center very important to Warren. So Warren is not interested in swinging for the fences on the investing side he wants to make sure the downside is well protected he definitely does not want to use a lot of debt and such and and we know that all those things about warren from the public domain but what it seared it in for me that he could have run berkshire in a manner that would have ended up with a stock price even two or three times where it is today but that isn't the important thing for him the important thing for him is to to finish first you have to first finish and and so he he took the patient steady route and that's a very important lesson for investors is is to take a very patient and steady route and i just wanted to highlight that in the concept context of something i ran into recently and arvind may know this but uh, fidelity recently did a study of which brokerage accounts at Fidelity perform the best. And uh, maybe Arvind has more color on it. So they, they studied all the different brokerage accounts. And there were these two people who were talking about it, James Oshog, Oshog and Essie and another guy. And then the other guy was joking, yeah, it was the people who were dead whose accounts performed the best. And then James Oshog and Essie said, no, that's close. It was the people who had forgotten that they had accounts at Fidelity. So when they looked at the performance of these different brokerage accounts that had stocks in them, the ones that performed the best were the ones that had absolutely no activity for a very long period of time, which means you know, they were people had picked a few stocks and then these guys just forgot they even had that account. And in the end, those accounts perform the best. That just shows you how much, how good brain power does for you in investing. And so there's a tremendous lesson in what Buffett is saying, and there's a tremendous lesson in that Fidelity study. So uh, the number one skill that you can bring to bear in investing is patience, extreme patience. And you, even if you go back and 
look at stocks you bought five years ago or 10 years ago and you may have sold them you just look at how they've done and many of them would have done vastly better than you would have thought and they've probably have done well even after you've sold them and so on so those are some of the, the lessons that stand out I mean, I think that on investing, first of all, every company is different. So you can't use the same kind of yardstick for different companies. But in general, I, I would say that once, once I make an investment, I usually have some thesis around what that, what that company is worth and likely to be worth in the next few years and why it's likely to be there. And then, you know, probably every few months I'll just look at what's happening in terms of what's transpired. Maybe it's every six months or a year or so and uh, see how it lines up with the, the original thesis and such. And, and then you, then you take it from there. So like when we, uh, when I invested in the money center banks, they were trading well below tangible book value and uh, tangible book value is a value of a bank, which is liquidated. If the book value is real that they could shut their doors and return the capital and that's what you want to get back and no solvent bank with the correct reserves and so on to trade below book value and in fact it should trade at some premium to book value because it's a going concern and what premium depends on kind of what they make on assets and so on and what their spreads and all that are interest rates and so on and uh, i would say when you look at something like money center banks probably the most optimistic scenario might be that at some point two times book value would be probably the extreme end of what it might be worth if you were drinking all the kool-aid and everything but one time book value is probably understating it and probably reality lies somewhere in between and so that like that we look at uh, different different metrics and you look at it based on what you think is appropriate not based on what price the market is setting for the security and in other facets of life, I think that there's a big, there's a big influence. Another book I read a long time back, I probably read this 15, 16 years ago called power versus force. It's written by a guy named David Hawkins, and he has a kind of a controversial, controversial approach. But the thesis of his book is that if I lie to you and in your conscious state, you don't know I'm lying to you in your subconscious state, you do. And for most humans, pipe between the subconscious and the conscious is mostly clogged, but it's not fully clogged. So what will happen is that if I'm lying to you, you'll get a feeling that you don't have a lot of interest in being around me, but you won't be able to tell why that is. And a good example is if you're in a use, if you're talking to a used car dealer and he's giving you his pitch on why that Ford Pinto is such a great car. You may not realize or understand what part of what he's telling you is a lie, but you generally get the feeling that you want to get as far away from him as quickly as possible. And, uh, and that's because you can tell that there's some things that he's saying that are probably not, not true. Whereas if you're hanging around with the Dalai Lama and he's talking, you probably want to increase that type of interaction as much as you can. And so this, this, the thesis of the book is that basically humans don't particularly care how bad the truth is, but what they care about is that you're telling the truth. So to give you an example, let's say my wife and I are about to go out to see a movie and have dinner and so on. And let's say she gets dressed and she asks me how the dress looks and let's say I have a perspective that the dress doesn't look that great. And uh, so since I read the book, I changed my answers and I encouraged to try this art that when I'm asked by her, how the dress look or this and that, I give an absolutely candid answer, even though I know that in the near term, it may lead to us missing the movie or the <laughs> date getting canceled or various other negative effects but the long-term impact of that is that she has a very high degree of trust that when i'm saying something to her it is the truth and that long term has huge positive impacts on the relationship so i would say that in 2008 for example our funds were down like 67 percent 
And I very candidly communicated with my investors. Obviously, first of all, they got the numbers which showed them what was going on. But I also clearly told them that it wasn't just the financial crisis that was causing these issues, that they were, we took zero, we took zeros on some investments and, and those zeros were not entirely because there was a financial crisis, though they were partially because of that, but a lot of it was my own mistakes. And, and quite frankly, the, our withdrawals and redemptions were pretty benign at that period and uh, investors basically had trust. And so I think that it takes a lifetime to build that trust. It takes a lifetime to always say the truth, but I would say that it's a very important thing not to say the small lies because the small lies add up and they erode trust. So as you go through your life, when you run into situations where you have a choice between truth and diplomacy, you should choose the truth, even if there's near term pain. And if you repeatedly choose the truth, then long term, the paybacks are exponential. And to some extent, I think that is exactly, to some extent, that is exactly what Buffett does. Buffett is all about candor and he always starts his annual reports with the mistakes and with the ne- with the bad news and he always tells his managers give me the bad news first and i think that's what that's the way you want to live your life is you want to give people the bad news first and you want to be candid about the bad news i'm trying to be like those fidelity account holders who've forgotten they have an account uh, because I actually think I'm not patient enough. I, I actually look at my portfolio and I truly think that if I just went away for 10 years and took no actions on any of it, I think we'd be just doing incredibly well. And I think one of the negatives in me is that unfortunately over the next 10 years, I know I will sell stuff that I should not sell and I know I will buy stuff that I should not have bought. So the very best thing I could do is just take a sabbatical and go bike riding with Guy Spear for the next 10 years. <laughs> that, that would be, and then just forget about the fund and everything and take it from there. So actually, I think the problem is the other way around. I think that I'm trying to become better at the patience game. I think Warren is really good at it. The big issue, big issue and big problem in the investing world is if you turn on CNBC, and you see all those ticker symbols flashing by, or you open a Bloomberg terminal and you see all those red and green lights and all that, all of that is telling you, you need to act now. The world is passing you by, you need to act now. And the reality is that real business change, it it happens over years and years. It doesn't happen over days or weeks or even months. It takes several years for that business change and business evolution to happen. And so you really have to give, just to tell you how impatient I am, I think there's only one stock in my portfolio that is more than three years old. To me, that does not sound like ultra patient behavior. Do you think that's patient? I didn't get a response or when I see people shaking their heads. They don't think you're patient. Yeah, exactly. So basically, I I think the lesson I'm trying to get better and better at is one of being more patient. And one thing I actually like about Tando, especially when we buy these wholly owned businesses, is uh, we'll never sell them. And I think that's probably the best thing you could possibly do is never sell. So I have businesses in my portfolio that it would not surprise me that in 10 years, they're trading at eight times, 10 times where they're trading today. And uh, I hope I'm smart enough not to sell them before that time. But I don't, I don't have the confidence that I'm that smart. Yeah, I think the, I think guys way of taking care of patients is from an office point of view is just never going to the office. Have you checked when's the last time he was in the office? He's been on a little bit of a book tour. Uh, yeah, he's always on some tour, and that's probably, the, that's probably the best thing he can do for his portfolio. Is just, yeah. in fact, I told him when I sent him that article about the fidelity study, I said I'm hesitating to send this to you because what little time you spend in the office is going to go very soon go to zero. <laughs> and, and his response was that he's just installed a very high-end espresso machine, and so <laughs> he's going to be going in for that, and so. 
So that should be fine. I think that it's a challenge, but the way I've, I've tried to set up the environment is first of all, things have to be at a total no brainer level for me to take the action of making a change. So when I go into the office, I don't go in with any interest or perspective that I'm going to make changes. Are we doing okay, Arvind? We're doing great. Okay. So basically, I don't go in with the idea that we're going to buy some stocks today or sell some stocks or any of that. I just don't have that. In fact, normally when I'm putting trades and I put them in after hours so that the markets being open has very little impact. And then the second is that I have many other activities that I'm involved in outside of buying and selling stocks. I don't run the foundation, but I do have some time that the foundation takes. Certainly Thando takes some time. I spend about four or five hours a week playing bridge, which is also, I think, a great activity that I strongly recommend. And uh, then I play racquetball and go biking and so on. Uh, I, I like to read and uh, I read all kinds of things which have nothing to do with investing. And so basically there's, I would say that the, I enjoy learning about businesses and I enjoy understanding what they're worth and so on and so forth. But the thing is that to get to the point of making investments, usually they have to be at, hit you between the eyes, total no brainer, because I have to then sell something to make room and so on. That's generally how I manage it. And the other way to, I would say, to manage the environment is to not have a team. So if you are in a structure where there are other partners or analysts or associates, then one's going to come to work with the idea that we're going to do something today and we're going to change the world today and all of those things. And I think that would be a negative. I don't have a blue book term, no. I just try to keep the environment as much away from getting you to be active. I don't, I don't talk about the positions much. Uh, there's not much frequent communication with the investors. When, I'm, when I am communi communicating with investors, I do not talk about what we presently own or presently buying. Because again, if I got questions on those, then I'd start defending why I bought them. And then that leads to a commitment and consistency bias, which means that even if I'm wrong, I'll say, oh, I told them all these things, so I can't sell it because then they'll think I'm stupid or something. And again, then that starts violating in a scorecard. It starts violating power scores and, uh, and so on. So you have to do things in a manner which make you in alignment and also make it easy to do what you're trying to do. And that's the way to do it. I would say the, the investment business, you're talking about for Bri funds? Yes. Yeah, so I would say the investment business is a little bit different than typical operating business. It, it does have some elements of that, but it, it's on a simpler and smaller scale. I don't have large scale HR issues, large scale CapEx issues. You have some elements of running business. I think that when I ran my, my IT services company, I probably learned a lot more about running businesses from that than I did from running Pabrai funds. I think Pabrai funds, I think what I'm proud of in, the term, in terms of the way, way it's run is how efficiently it's run. I, the entire workforce, excluding me, is part-time stay-at-home moms. And uh, basically the world misprices and misjudges the talent capability of stay-at-home moms. And they're not in a position or interested in taking up full-time careers, but to think that all of them can only lick stamps is ridiculous, but that's what the world does. Is that they think that all they can do is do a $10 an hour part-time job or something. And so what I found is that the stay-at-home moms, I have people in the office who had very high-flying careers in different areas, and now we are able to give them lots of challenging work, and they're pretty much running the operation on all, all facets of it, including SEC compliance and so on and so forth. And, and we do it on a payroll that would shock most people. And I think that it's the Pabrai funds part of it probably runs at under $100,000 a year in payroll, excluding me, on assets of 700 million. So yeah, you can run a few, you can learn a few things on running a business from a fund, running a fund, but I think you can learn a little bit more if you have experience in an operating business, which is a little more size, but I think it all applies. I think that if you ran a lemonade stand when you were a teenager and had a paper route or any of those things, all of those things help and add up. But if you get a little more size and scale to what you're doing, that that's even more helpful. 
and yeah definitely it's very helpful to then understand how CEOs of large companies might be running the businesses and what they keep front and center in front of them and what's likely the important factors to focus on. Yeah, the thing is my, my steady state assumption is that I'm a gentleman of leisure. And if I was surprised, but someone asked my daughters, one of my daughters recently, what does your dad do? And uh, her response was, he sleeps and and he's on Facebook and that's it. That was her definition of what I did, sleeping and being on Facebook. And I do take afternoon naps, which are really good. In fact, I had a nice nap just before we got started today. Thank you, Arvin, for starting at a time which allowed for my nap. That was good. My pleasure. Uh, oh, sure. Thank you. The 7 p.m in east coast and 4 p.m here works out well i assume i'm a general of leisure i'll tend to read whatever i enjoy i probably have probably at least 50 books sitting here which i have not read yet and uh, many of them are not worth reading and i'll find that out soon so i may read 10 20 pages and decide this is useless and give up on them but uh, but i'll pick up different books different depending on my 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 interest at the time and i was telling arvind that there's a there's a stock that's shown up on the radar that looks quite interesting and so recently i pushed all the books aside and recently i've been reading and chewing on the business and just trying to get an understanding of whether i'm not even sure it's within my circle of competence or not but it looks interesting and i'm enjoying the, the research so far and uh, so that's what I'm doing. But basically, it's uh, there's no strategic plan. It's just go the way the wind blows. The steady state, just keep reading. I'm, I have subscriptions to three newspapers a day, so I read those. I have subscriptions to a number of different magazines, Forbes, Fortune, Business Week, and Economist, and so on. I read those, and I have a Manual of Ideas subscription and Value Line subscription and different subscriptions, so I read those. And some message boards, I look at what's happening. I'll go to Value Investors Club once in a while. And then obviously, like there's a website, Data Roma, which does a nice job of condensing what the new 13F data is on different investors. And I look at that too. So between all of that, I can usually find enough things to keep me busy on a reading perspective. I, that's kind of a little a difficult question to answer because some things are being processed almost at a subconscious level in the sense that I may not myself even articulate clearly to myself what, what things are going But in general, you know, if I'm looking at a stock, I'm looking for a reason to say no, not a reason to say yes. And I'm looking for a reason to say no as soon as possible so that I can go back to other things of more interest. And when people bring up a stock to me or when I look at a 13F or something or data room or something, I'm, I'll ask myself, okay, first of all, is it within circle of competence? And if it's clearly out, then, you know, good, I'm done with it. So that's done. Then if it's within circle of competence, then I ask myself the second question, is it super cheap? And nowadays, you know, with the way the US markets are, I don't think markets are overvalued, but I don't think they're, they're nothing like 2009. And uh, so there's, in fact, um, I found a couple of things to do, which are in the US, it's very low, liquidity and volume so i'm just nibbling every day as much as we can get but for the most part we haven't found anything in the us for a while and even the idea i'm looking at now which looks interesting is outside the us so the models are you know, those are the first two models competence and valuation and that pretty much blows out large portions of it and then if it looks like something within the circle of competence and then it looks like it's cheap then i'll spend maybe a half an hour or something Excuse me. And and again, it's the idea is to find something that is going to be a showstopper, which is telling me, aha, uh -huh, I got why I would not want to be interested in buying this. And then if I don't find it in half hour, then I'll invest some more time, it might take an hour or two, again, digging a little deeper. And again, with the idea is always to find a reason to, to stop looking and moving on. And if I am if I'm continuing to look, then that means that there are a few aspects of the business that I'm finding very attractive. And 
at least till that point, I've not found anything which is telling me to stop looking. So I don't know if that helps on the model side. So one of the things in investing is that the data set is too large. And like that spreadsheet I sent Arvind has no 14,000 stocks. And that's not even all the stocks in the world. All the stocks in the world, maybe 50,000 or something, or 25 to 50,000, something in that range. And just looking at one business could take you two, three weeks. And so, you know, if you spend even a week on a business, you couldn't look at more than 50 businesses in a year. And in the US, that'd be like 1% or something of the public companies. And so the key is that you have to take shortcuts, which help you eliminate large portions of the universe in a very short period of time. So it leaves a wide open portion of time or the things that do look it's a promising kind of data set to probe into so that that i think is a is more art than science but you've got to have a way and so if you for example did cloning and did 13 f's that's a great way to cull the data set so if you just said okay i'm only going to look at what other great investors have bought then you might be down to maybe less than 100 stocks a year that you look at and uh, and then within the hundred and you again look at which one that cheap by your definition and within circle of competence by your definition then again that hundred is going to go down quite dramatically so you you may not, not you may not need to look at that many stocks in a year and then the number becomes quite manageable just just on that in the google talk you discussed ipsco and the funeral services business how you thought about different ideas at the moment in time when you made the investment could you discuss similar ideas that you had made that you've since exited that were successful investments and how you thought about it at that moment in time for us let me think about uh, some that I'm trying to think of what uh, last names might be worth thinking about you can come back to the question if you want i can ask another so, yeah i haven't had i haven't had exits many exits for a few years and the idea it could it could be it could be very old it, it's more about how yeah that's what i'm saying I'm, i was uh, there was a one of the, I, I think this was probably the first investment the fund made and it was in a it was in a company called silicon valley bank and uh, silicon valley bank was a is a is an interesting bank uh, i think they're still around i don't know if someone bought them or not but they they basically were headquartered in silicon valley and they're a pretty well-run bank what they would do is they basically focus on venture backed startups which means they already had a bunch of money in the bank and so on and then they'd focus on conservative lending using usually asset-based lending and so on to these companies but they'd also what they'd also do was when they'd make the loans They'd also take warrants from these private companies in addition to what they were getting on the regular loan term. In 99, middle of 99, when the fund started, the dot-com boom was more and more fuel was being added to that fire and it was raging. And the Silicon Valley Bank was sitting on this very large number of, you could say a basket of warrants of a bunch of these dot-com venture-backed startups. But when I looked at the valuation of the bank, it was very modest. It was just a small premium over book. And so these, there wasn't a lot of disclosure on these warrants in the filings, but you knew that they would talk about a little bit saying that this basket of warrants and you could look at the companies that they were doing business with. And so my take was that I actually believed at the time that the internet would be transformational. I just wasn't willing to pay a hundred times earnings for pets.com. Right. Uh, and, and so my take was that if I bought stock in the bank, then, you know, I have downside protection because it's a sensibly run place, but it's got a moonshot built in if those warrants come in and if this madness continued. And, and I think in a very short period of time, we had a double on the stock and other people started to realize that these warrants had value and such, and then we exited. And so that wasn't a holding we held for very long, but the thesis was, okay, we've got this basket there, which is giving us a kind of a unknown upside without downside and unknown upside without downside is a really good mental model. In general, in general markets, 
are very bad at pricing uncertainty properly. So there was no way for the equity markets to properly price that unknown basket of warrants. If they had done a disclosure, which said, okay, look, here's the 200 companies that we have warrants on, and here's the number of warrants, and here's the strike price and all that, then you could you could take 10 of them or 20 of them or something, and which were the most, where most of the value was, and ascribe some value to them, which is probably the way it was where probably a lot of the value was sitting in a few of the companies that they had. So that that model, mental model that was used to make that investment was completely different than the model I might have used, let's say, to make the IFSCO investment. Right. So different. And and you basically look at you look at different situations and you can come up with different perspectives. If you look at the three G guys, for example, the ones Buffett's partnered with, and you look at what they've done at Burger King and at AM InBev and probably what they're likely to do at Kraft and now with this Tim Hortons acquisition, these guys can squeeze blood out of a rock. And so if someone were to make an investment in one of the things that they are into, you can probably assume that historic margins, they were, they'll probably figure out a way to get some more out of it. And if the top line is stagnant or growing a little bit, they'll probably get a little more juice out of it. And so if you understood that about the manager, then you could say, okay, if something that looks fully priced, may not actually be fully priced because you're not taking into account the new manager. What so those are different examples of models you can use. That's great. And so Silicon Valley Bank, how did you stumble across that idea? How does one screen for something like that? Or you can't really. So what triggered your initial interest to take a look at that? I'm not sure exactly how it crossed my radar. It may have, it may have been on a list of some companies or something that sometimes they put up these lists of, I'm not exactly sure how it came up on the radar, but sure. the thing is I was at the time, I had made another investment in 95, which is about five years before the fund on another dot com type, type of stock, which was called CMGI. And eventually it went past section. They had their offices in Massachusetts and CMGI had investments in like a hundred plus, hundred plus internet companies. And uh, when I originally invested in them, it was very modestly priced. It was priced at just a small premium to cash. So again, it was like Silicon Valley bank in the sense that they had all these different investments, but you weren't really paying a lot. And this was in 95. So it was many years before the market went crazy and we made a hundred X on, on CMGI. So this is before the funds and such. And so I, and I was lucky I got most of it out before things crashed and burned, but, and in hindsight, that was a mistake because I should have sold that even at five X I should have sold because at that point it was already, if you will. But I, at the time in 99, I was looking to find vehicles like that, but I wanted to get more safety. I wanted the downside protected. And I think that's why when Silicon Valley came up on the radar and I looked at it in more, I kicked the tires quite a bit on that on, because I was always concerned about lending activity to these tech companies, because you know, how do you. How do you get your money out because they don't have much intangible assets but on that front what they did is they only stuck to venture back startups which were already pretty high quality and then they made sure that enough protection on hard assets and such so so i think that worked out pretty good but i would love to find uh, something like that now that'd right. be nice right. the moonshots are always good if you can get them with no downside right. Ignore the book because mm -hmm. the book is stupid. What you want is very simple. You want as close to 100% probability of at least a 2x in two years, as close to a zero probability of anything else, or if it's a 90% probability of a 2x in two years, then the other 10% should be above a 1x, which means you don't lose money. And losing money should be very infinitesimal. So it should be, when you look at it, you should have confidence that the odds that you would actually end up with a permanent loss of capital are as close to zero as you can get. So I would say that if you're looking at probabilities, then the curve should look at something like 
one percent of or lower probability of decline permanent decline of more than or less than let's say 20 let's say losing between zero and 30 percent should be under one percent losing more than 30 percent should approach zero and then less than a double between 1x and 2x maybe is under 10 percent and above 2x is the rest of it those probabilities sound good to me ask the question is to answer it. If you are questioning whether something is in your circle of competence, trust me, it is not in your circle of competence. Because what Buffett says is that the most important thing is to operate within your circle of competence. And ideally, you don't want to operate near the edges. You want to operate dead center. And so it should be obvious that something is within that circle. How you know, like, you like I, I gave the example in that Google talk about that billionaire John Ariega sure, who only yeah. buys real estate within two miles of Stanford. I think anytime he looks at something in about three seconds, he answers the question of whether it's in circle of competence. And once he gets five miles from the center, he knows he's outside the circle. Yeah, that's a good question. And I would say that, the, in fact, the idea I'm researching now, that's a question that's twirling in my head in the sense that there are some aspects of the business that I understand and some aspects I'm trying to understand. And there's enough there that is prompting me not to give up. But I would say that I would not make the investment if I cannot, within three sentences, nail down exactly what the bottom line is you know what's going to happen here and what type of money we're likely to make and what time frame and all of that and so on i think i think the good news of the circle of competence is that unlike being a basketball player or something where you know after 30 or something you're going to start declining here in investing you're going to keep improving over your whole lifetime and over your whole lifetime that circle is gradually going to increase in size just by default because and it'll especially increase in size each time you lose money because that'll really teach you a whole bunch of stuff and the key is not to focus on trying to increase the size of the circle the key is to that'll happen by osmosis but the key is to work very hard to always stay within the circle Yeah, I actually ignore currencies because I don't really have a view on it and okay. uh, hedging and such can become expensive. Sure. So I, I don't mess around with trying to hedge currencies or any of that. I just assume that, I mean, if the business ideas work out, even if we have some currency movement against us, it should still be fine. Sure. And the currencies may, may move in our favor. We don't know that. So. What was your second part of the question was about, yeah, I think about different parts of the world. I'm learning more and more about different parts of the world. And I definitely feel that the closer you are to home, the more you understand and the better off you are. I definitely feel it takes, it takes more effort. And even then you may miss some obvious things, which may be obvious to local. So clearly there are risks involved when you go global, but at the same time, again, if, in spite of those risks, if things are looking like no brainers, then you can look at that. I would say that patience is a big part of the equation. I think that you can be right about all your analysis of the stock, but just not keep it long enough. And stocks, you can study this, right? Like stocks have done an average about nine or 10% a year. But if you study the long history of stocks, it's not coming in like clockwork. It's very lumpy. And uh, so you can have large movements in short periods of time and no movement for long periods of time and all of that. So patience is a big part of it. I think sticking within circle of competence is a big part of it. I think that uh, some other things that are useful is that one of the reasons why cloning is such a good idea is because it's already made it through the filters in one brain. 
And if you admire that brain, and if things have already made it through that brain. And so the important thing with cloning is that you should focus on cloning the ideas that are the biggest positions of the people who made those bets, like the top three or four. If you were looking at the top three or four or five bets that a person has made, rather than the 30th bet he's made, the 30th bet is not going to help you that much. But so the interesting thing about the cloning is that if you look at your top five position of David Einhorn, top five position of Bill Ackman, top five position of Carl Icahn, top five position of Warren Buffett, top five position of Seth Klarman, and so on, then you know that those are, that's a really good pond to go fishing in because it's already been through one filter. And so when you start looking at some things that have already been through one filter and you only look at that pool, then that's a big advantage. And that there's, when you go to a bowling alley and if the objective is to get the highest score when you're bowling, how many of you have bowled before? Can you raise your hand? Looks like we've got some bowling, bowling aficionados in your class. <laughs> Maybe you can take them bowling, Arvind. I will bowl with bumpers, though, so I won't be there. Yeah, there you go. So when you go bowling, if the idea is that you have to get the best score, then you know you can bowl two ways, with bumpers or without bumpers. So if you could bowl with bumpers or without bumpers, which would you choose? With bumpers, as students are saying. Would anyone choose without bumpers? <laughs> so no bowling with bumpers is basically like doing cloning of 13 Fs because it's already been through one idea. So the odds that you'll have a gutter ball just go down dramatically. You may still end up with the ball going off to the side when it gets close to the pins, but the odds are very low. And so I think those are the important things is you, you avoid leverage, you be patient, stick to circular competence, go away for a long time after you've made your portfolio, bowl with bumpers, you know, those are all good things to do. That's a great question. Yeah. So these are all negotiated transactions with people who I think are smarter than me, who are focused on full price or better. Usually they want more than a full price. And so I think the, the interesting thing is that I'm actually just, I'm looking at a business that unfortunately I think I'll only be able to get a minority position because the founders not looking to sell much of what he has and then we might put in some growth capital and so on. And we'll pay a very full price for that if we do it, but the nature of that business and such is such that I think that almost, almost for sure we'll make five to 10 times our money in five years or seven years. And so I, I can't find uh, it's one of the advantages of the, these private deals is that one of these small businesses tend not to be in the public markets in general. I think if you're looking at businesses with market caps, less than 50 million or 25 million in the public markets. One, one of the problems in the public markets is that, that market cap level, you've got so much overhead for being a public company and such that the economics, I think don't work out. And those types of businesses are zombie businesses that maybe were good businesses at one point or something, but they've run into some issue which has caused the market cap to go where it's gone. Whereas some of the businesses I'm looking at are still growing and are not upswing, but they're just small. I think that the interesting thing about these, these insurance companies is the one is that I can add some value with the port portfolio. So what can look like a full price based on the business before Thando steps in can look a little more attractive once we are part of the equation because of doing a little better job on the investments. And the other thing is that today, actually, the pricing, I think, for insurance companies is lower than historical and maybe even future because the interest rates are so low. So if I'm looking at an insurance company that has everything in fixed income, let's say, for example, and there are some insurance companies like that, then the investment portfolio is not doing anything. And so then when you look at valuation in terms of premium to book or multiples and different things, it will take that into account. And if interest rates were 12%, then, you know, those businesses would be worth and be sold for different prices. So to some extent, this is a good time to go hunting, but 
anytime you're getting to negotiated transactions, you're facing intelligence sellers and especially the people I'd like to buy these businesses, which we are not intending to sell. I definitely don't want to buy them from stupid people. So I'd be disappointed if they didn't get full prices. Well, I think we've worn Berkshire a few times and I think sometimes it's gotten cheaper than at other times. And like, for example, there's a, and I may not have all my facts straight on that, but there's a, there's an emerging young investor called Alan Meacham. And maybe uh, Arvind, you can have him come and speak to your class. I think he's in Utah or someplace. Arlington Capital Management or something is the name of the fund. I think they have a few hundred billion under management and he had a, and probably still has, I think a pretty large position in Berkshire. I seem to recall it was more than 50% of the fund. And what he had done is he had levered that portfolio, borrowed against it to, to juice the returns. And he basically levered it because he in effect, thought that with Berkshire, there was a put where Warren had said that below 1.2 times book, he'll buy back stock. And so in effect, when before that was 1.15, 1.1. And whenever Buffett said that, the stock basically never went below those floors. Or if it went below the floor, it just came right back up because that's the time when Warren was buying. So he bought his position basically right at or slightly above that floor with the assumption that it will do reasonably well over the future. And then he, he levered it on top of that to juice the returns and he did quite well. Now I looked at that and to me, the perspective was I remembered Buffett's story about Rick Gurren. And the mm -hmm. thing is that the Buffett put, if you will, there are circumstances under which Buffett would not exercise that put. So for example, if you got to 2009 type pricing, rather than buying Berkshire stock, he'd be looking to buy other things that he wouldn't care if Berkshire went down. It's unlikely, very unlikely. But in those types of scenarios, Alan might get margin calls and it didn't happen during the period that he owned it. Yeah, so in general, I would say the uh, with Berkshire, you would do reasonably well, but I think it's just so large that I think you ought to be able to find things that will do better unless it gets close to that floor level pricing. Locadia is a different animal now because the two founders are gone and there's another guy running it. So you have to handicap what that guy does. Fairfax, you know, actually they have a stated objective of delivering 15% or more long-term returns to investors. So if you agree with that and you think they'll do that and that's your objective, then that'd be a good stock to own. For that but i think that if you're working with small amounts of capital you ought to be able to do better than any of those things. yeah i'm an index guy in the niche and i used to work for vanguard several years ago so i've actually got a pretty large position in the vanguard 500 index okay vanguard index 500. Yeah. I have about 40% of my portfolio due to mathematical calculation on my part in Jammu and Kashmir Bank in India. Jammu and Kashmir Bank. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Oh, Next. Yeah. Mosaic Corp. Okay. Oh, Any more? CBS. I'm sorry? CBS. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, what is that? DDS. DDS? No, CVS, like Rite Aid. Oh, CVS Pharmacy. Okay, good, a cloner. Any others? Yeah. Solid Smoker, a real estate company in Florida. Sure, Winter, Winter, Winter Green Funds. Yes. Okay. Good. In case I'm twiddling my thumbs, I have a few things to look at. How much more time do we have, Arvind? Are we out of time? Last year you said we were going to rage, and then you made fun of us. You can go as long as you want. No problem. <laughs> I already had my nap. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, actually, Pabrai Funds, if I were not managing it, I would return the capital. And I think the investors would want the capital return if there was a change along those lines. And I don't really think of it as work. It's actually fun. It's amazing. I get paid for it, which is great. Yeah, it's not any different from running my own money, own portfolio. And so I don't really consider it any kind of burden, if you will. So there are no plans to, to make any changes. And, when and there, there, there is no long-term strategic plan. The long-term strategic strategic plan is to just avoid making stupid decisions and make as few decisions as possible. Yeah, I saw some talk, I think, with Todd Coombs was saying that Buffett had talked at Columbia and said that he was reading like 500 pages a day. And 500 pages a day is quite a bit of reading. I haven't ever measured how much I'm reading every day. And I don't know how you would put newspaper reading or scanning into that. And I don't think I'm anywhere near 500 pages a day. I, my guess would be I'm maybe at 100 pages a day or something. I think my guess, something like that. Sometimes when I'm reading a book, I'll do more than 100 pages in a day. And so it might be 100, 150 pages, something like that. Well, you know, there was, there's a guy in your group who mentioned that they own Jammu and Kashmir bank. And so what's the P ratio of Jammu and Kashmir bank? Six times earnings. Six times earnings. Is that cheap? I think so. Yes. <laughs> Definitive yes, he's saying. Okay. Okay. And what should be the multiple of Jammu and Kashmir bank? Maybe closer to 10 or 12. 10 to 12 times, maybe more, you say. If you look at a, if you look at a bank in India, for generally speaking, what happens with, and this is in India, probably elsewhere too, but I think probably more, more true in India, is a bank in India, a reasonably well-run bank, ought to grow at a multiple of GDP. Did you consider that in your thesis? Yeah, I took into account sort of state population growth. Okay, so what is India's recent GDP growth? About 5 to 7%. And that is pre-Modi. Right. What do you expect India's GDP growth to be, let's say, in the next few years? Hopefully about 8 or 9. Okay, and uh, typically I would say that a bank, a decently run bank in India, should be growing at something like two times GDP. And eight or nine may get aggressive, but let's say we don't even put any anything much of a Modi factor in there. It would not be surprising if something like Jammu and Kashmir Bank is growing earnings at 15% a year. I didn't hear, I didn't hear a yes. yes. Okay. So if we have a business that is earning, let's say $100 a share, or $100 a year, let's say it's earning 100 million a year, for example. And let's say that 100 million a year is increasing at 15% a year. What multiple should we put on that business? Yes, 10, or 10 to 15 times, maybe a little higher. Okay, so let's say that Jammu and Kashmir Bank Let's pull some numbers out of the air. Okay, let's say it has a market cap of 600 million. And let's say they're earning 100 million. Is, are they at six times earnings? Yeah. Okay, so let's say they're earning 100 million. Let's say the market cap is 600 million. And uh, some of you guys have calculators. Let's go five years. So at a 15% increase in earnings every year, what is the earnings in year, year five? Is it 200, Arvind, approximately? Yes, you don't need a calculator, yeah. Okay, it's 200. Okay, yeah. and if you put a 15 multiple on 200, that'd be 3 billion. Yeah. And if you put a 20 multiple, it'd be 4 billion. Are those numbers higher than 600 million? <laughs> yes. So does it matter what multiple we put on it? No. I'm saying it doesn't matter if it trades in 15 times earnings 
or 20 times earnings in five years? No, it doesn't matter. What if the multiple is 10 times earnings? Still a great return. I mean, that'd be a 2 billion market cap. So 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion, are they all acceptable answers? Yes. Now, assuming, uh, uh, assuming that the assumptions play out the way that you expect them. Yeah, to. so what I'm saying is, so at least we don't need to rack our brains on what the multiple will be or should be or ought to be. We can just say that if those numbers play out, if it goes from 100 million in earnings to 200 million in earnings and it goes steadily up like that, the odds are very high that the market cap is between two and four billion. And of course, we don't know whether earnings will do that. And they could be a choppier or they could be a better. The thing is in the sense that it's possible Modi really kicks in and the bank is doing 20% a year, so 15%, for example. Or Modi doesn't kick in and the bank is doing 12% a year. So you can run those same numbers at 12%. And even then, you would still end up. So the thing is, the, where you would lose money is what is the book value of the bank? Do you know what the book value is? What multiple to book does it trade at? One. Yeah, close to one. Close to one. He's, he's saying close to one, maybe low. So basically, if their loan book is good, if their reserves are good, and in fact, they don't even need to be that good. Basically, if their future earnings can absorb any hiccups they have on their books if you will basically there is that that is the kind of bet that's very well making and i'm so grateful that you brought it to my attention well the guy sitting behind you probably has better answers than me but i would say that first of all it's it's not a private bank it's uh, it's an unusual bank because it's owned it's majority owned by the state government of jammu and kashmir i think what is there i think like a 50 50 percent stake or something yeah it's about half it's almost right so it's not like hdfc or ici bank which is purely privately held this is like a public sector bank but it's actually an interesting public sector bank because it, it it behaves like a private sector bank. The second is that the state of Jammu and Kashmir, especially nowadays when they're, the two sides are lobbing grenades at each other and all of that, India and Pakistan, it's a very heavily militarized area. Generally speaking, investors are a little leery of the prospects of a financial institution. Recently, there were floods in very significant floods in Srinagar and around and I think probably a lot of the bank's branches got affected and it's possible that their loan book got affected and such because of those people that took loans maybe in dire states and so on. So they may have real pain from those recent floods. So we'll have to see. But in general, the flip side is that India, I think, has issued like one or two banking licenses in 10 years. I think still about 70% of assets are with these horribly run public sector state-owned banks which are owned by the central government, which are gradually going down in, in, in value uh, or in, uh, in percent of the pie. And uh, I think that half the country doesn't have a bank account. And that is front and center for Modi. He actually has that particular metric directly in his sights and he wants to in his five years dramatically change the number of people who have bank accounts so it's possible that banking gets significant tailwinds other questions my take would be the biggest issue would be with this jammu and kashmir bank is today is october 9th 2014 if you can avoid selling it till at least october 8th 2024 can you do that? Yeah. <laughs> you okay. Can do that. I'll do that. If you, you get an it. urge, if you get an urge to sell before then, call me collect. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll talk you off the ledge. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the best investment you can make is a company that's very cheap and that has high, good growth prospects and generates high returns on capital. 
in other words, Jammu and Kashmir Bank. <laughs> I don't know why you didn't have him run the class, Arvind. That's that's the second half of the semester. <laughs> okay, all right, good. I might sit in on that lecture. There'll be many lectures. <laughs> okay, all right, that's good. I mean, I think the, the, the main thing is that you have to have a temperament which says on a daily basis that you do nothing and that you'll only act when there's no spreadsheet required, when it's hitting you between the eyes with a two by four and it's total no brain. And when those things come about, that's when you pull the trigger. In other words, Jammu and Kashmir bank. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. I think I'll just digress for a second before I answer that. But the thing is, if you look at Buffett's different investments and you put them in different categories like banks or media, insurance companies, real retailers and so on, his batting average, for example, on investing in banks is a thousand. I am not aware of any banking investment that Warren has made. He's been investing in banks since 1969. And he used to own a bank completely, First Rockford in Illinois. And he actually used to go to Rockford, Illinois once a month to look at the books and so on. And he still has a subscription to American Banker, which is a daily newspaper. So I don't believe there is a banking analyst on the planet that's better than Buffett on banking. I think the guy, he's never ever been wrong on a bank. But again, if you take the same Warren Buffett and you look at his batting average on retailers, it is horrible, mistake after mistake. Most of Berkshire's retail operations are useless. He's too diplomatic to say it in the annual report because that would make the CEOs of the companies look bad. But most of those jewelry operations they bought, most of those furniture operations they bought, you know, I think Nebraska Furniture Mart is fine, probably Borshams is fine, but most of those other ones, are useless. They haven't delivered anywhere near. In fact, most of them probably have not delivered anywhere near what he's paid for them and so on. But also, again, if you look at Buffett in media, almost a thousand batting average, almost always been right on media. So I think, first of all, I think that if you are buying a business which is in secular decline, that has similar attributes to shorting a stock, though not as bad. So I would generally stay away from these businesses and you know, I used to own Sears and I got my head handed to me and I learned the difficult way that, so Sears basically will, no matter how many IQ points you add to Eddie Lampert, Eddie Lampert is a third rate retailer. He may be a first rate investor, but being a great investor has nothing to do with running a retail operation or knowing how to run a great retail operation. They're two completely different skill sets. And he's, his CEOs at Sears, that's just a revolving door. They just come and go. And they'll keep coming and going. Now it's himself, so I guess he won't fire himself. So I think Sears, basically, how many of you shop at Sears? No one here shops. Did they not hear the question? I don't see any hands. No. How many of you shop at Sears.com? No one. How many of you there is a Sears.com? <laughs> What about, uh, how about Sears Your Way? How many of you have heard of Sears Your Way? The guy who asked the question on Sears, he must have heard of Sears Your Way because that's all Eddie talks about. No. Even he denies having heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so there's your answer. The people who shop at Sears are dying every day, unfortunately. <laughs> Service Corp is burying them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the people, being born today will never ever shop at Sears. So you have secular guaranteed decline. And one thing about businesses that you have to understand is there are businesses that are recurring revenue. Recurring revenue is an amazing concept that you cannot give enough weight to when you're making the investments. Going back to our favorite stock, Jammu and, Jammu and Kashmir Bank, that is a recurring revenue business. When you get banking clients, people don't switch bank accounts every three months or six months. When they have a loan with you, they're paying you for a while. Those relationships just stay. When you're a retailer, every 
time a consumer is going to buy something, they have a choice as to who they buy from. And you can get the stickiness like Amazon. Amazon has a lot of stickiness. Sears at one point had stickiness. But when that stickiness is in decline, reversing that is almost impossible. In fact, Buffett said that he knows of no, no examples of successful retailer turnarounds. Zero. So I think that there is no way out for Mr. Lamb. Manish, thank you. Thank you once again for being so generous with your time and so forthright with your learnings. It really means a lot to everyone in this room. And I'm sure it'll mean a lot to everyone who sees the video. My pleasure. And you know what we'll do, Arvind, is when we meet every year, we'll take a look at the Jammu and Kashmir stock price. <laughs> That's what we will do that. Yeah, once a year. And can we make sure that our Jammu and Kashmir analyst joins us every year? We can do that. It may we can do it in Omaha or in, in Boston. It'll be great. Okay, that sounds great. Okay. All right, thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, Manish. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.